So cognitive neuroscience is an area that's uh, expanding in its influence and, and tackling many phenomena that, that uh, uh, previously were left to uh, psychologists or uh, uh, educators and sociologists. One of the examples of a, of a recent area where uh, cognitive neuroscience has offered new insights is the area of socioeconomic status and uh, the way it influences um, uh, cognitive and brain development. Now, we know that uh, um, the environment can influence children's development, both physically, emotionally, and cognitively. Exactly what factors in the environment are influencing children? As scientists, we like to have things that we can measure. One of the measures we can take from the environment that seems to explain a fair amount of the variability in uh, children's development is socioeconomic status. Now, socioeconomic status is a, is a kind of construct. It in, in, uh, combines m multiple aspects, uh, but broadly it's characterizing a family. Uh, it's characterizing in that family the amount of economic resources they have, but also aspects of, of uh, social uh, hierarchy, of prestige, uh, of power. So typically uh, in studies we might measure it by looking at the, the level of the parent's education, or uh, we might look at the, the family income. Uh, one of the most striking features of socioeconomic status on children's development uh, is that by the time children start school, you can already see big gaps in the behaviors and, and the cognitive abilities, say the, the uh, vocabulary size of children according to the socioeconomic status, or, or I'll, I'll call it SES, the SES of the families they come from. And once children start school, three, four, five years of age, those gaps, they don't narrow. They often persist throughout the school years. So there's a big concern there. What are these influences of socioeconomic status? How are they impacting on children? And what can we do about that to try and close the gaps caused by the, the differences in, in family background? So, that is the goal of cognitive neuroscience, to understand mechanisms. If we understand causes, that enables us to try and intervene and to, to figure out the easiest way to ameliorate, to reduce the consequences uh, on children's development of these differences in uh, uh, family background. So if you look at behavior, what's interesting about the effects of SES on behavior uh, is that they're uneven across different abilities. In fact, that's, that's one of the puzzles for instance, uh, there was one study by um, Daniel Hankman and Martha Farah suggested that perhaps a third of the variation in children's vocabulary size, their language development, can be explained by socioeconomic status. That's a large amount of variability. If you look at areas of behavioral regulation, children's uh, uh, um, whether they can control or inhibit their cognitive functions, its so-called executive functions, uh, about 6% of the variation is explained by socioeconomic status. A similar amount is explained in the variation of their working memory ability, what they can keep in mind. But then you look at, at something like their visual spatial skills, um, working in space, remembering spatial configurations, there's not much influence of socioeconomic status on that aspect. So why is it that socioeconomic status would have that uneven kind of influence uh, across the development of different kinds of, of skills in children? Ultimately, we expect socioeconomic status to have a biological influence at some level. And so one of the places we want to start is to investigate what effects socioeconomic status may have on the brain. So let me give you an example of a study, uh, which was a large study looking at uh, I think it was a thousand children in the US and this was uh, a study led by uh, uh, Kimberly Noble. What they did was to scan the brain structure of these thousand children uh, and look in detail at the, the uh, surface area of the cortex, the thickness of the cortex and see whether they could detect uh, the impact of the family socioeconomic status on children's brain structure. Now this is a very kind of gross measure looking at, at just the, the amount of white matter and gray matter in the brain. Uh, and the effects are quite small, 
the researchers needed a large sample in order to detect these differences, but ultimately they did show variations, particularly in cortical surface area, uh, according to socioeconomic status. Interestingly, the differences they found were in temporal regions and in frontal regions of the brain. And that fits with what we see in behavior. The temporal regions of the brain are involved in language processing. The frontal regions of the brain are involved in executive function. So it fits with what we're seeing in behavior. Uh, it's also possible that those parts of the brain have the longest developmental trajectory. And maybe this long period of development for temporal and frontal regions gives the most opportunity for the environment to influence their development. Uh, a couple of other things you might say about that, that um, uh, the effects were really quite small. There were only one or two percent of the variation in brain structure was being explained by uh, socioeconomic status, even though, as I said, about a third of the variation in language development um, uh, was predicted by that same variable. So it's more obvious in behavior than it is in these uh, subtle measures of brain structure. That's just looking at structure, but you can also look at the function of the brain. So one of the things we can do is to measure uh, the electrical activity going on in the brain uh, by measuring it at the scalp using electrodes. These are very small voltages, and what you can do is to see changes in those voltages as children carry out tasks. So there was a study carried out by Courtney Stephen and, and Stevens and, and Helen Neville where they uh, played children different sounds. And they were only supposed to pay attention to one of the sounds and ignore the other sound. And children from a low socioeconomic status background, their brains were less able to ignore, to screen out the information that they were not supposed to pay attention to. So the suggestion there was that there was a problem in, in selective attention uh, in those children. So both evidence on, on brain structure and evidence on um, brain function that socioeconomic status is, is having an effect at a biological level. Well, we have to think about how that's going to work. What is the actual pathway between which uh, you have these things that you measure in the environment and these effects on brain structure and brain function? Here as scientists we run into a bit of a problem. So the problem is we like to detect correlations and they suggest causal pathways. But what we have with socioeconomic status is a kind of uh, a mashing together of lots of correlated factors in the environment. The family that has uh, fewer resources, uh, that they're poorer, uh, the parents may be less educated, they, the household may be uh, uh, in a poorer neighborhood, it may be a less structured household, there may be fewer resources, fewer books, fewer toys, and maybe uh, the parents interact with the children differently, they're more stressed, they have less quality time with the children, uh, the parents may be less healthy, they're having to work longer hours for lower wages. It may be that, that when the mother was pregnant, that maybe she was more stressed, maybe her nutrition wasn't, wasn't as high, maybe uh, she has a baby with a lower birth weight, maybe it's more likely that she gets depressed afterwards. So you find a lot of these factors correlated with socioeconomic status. Which of those is having an effect on brain development and behavioral development? It's difficult to answer these questions and neuroscience is using a set of different methods we talked about brain imaging, but also looking at, at animal models and, and computational models of, of uh, the development of neural systems to try and understand the pathways by which this can take place. So typically we pull apart two different uh, uh, influences on families. We think about uh, the level of stress in the family, uh, and these are kind of toxic effects of stress. We also think about uh, the level of resources and opportunities in the family. And then we map those into some possible causal pathways affecting brain development, and those are roughly of, of three different types. You can think of uh, prenatal effects on a child's development. These are effects that will happen when, when uh, the mother is pregnant, maybe she's more stressed, has poor nutrition, maybe she's more likely to uh, smoke or drink. These are effects on, on the development of the embryo. The second type of effect would be postnatal parenting. 
the nature of the relationship between the parent and the child and uh, the nurturing that's happening. And then another type would be the level of cognitive stimulation, how rich the experiences are for the child. So these three different uh, pathways. So um, we don't exactly know which are responsible and there might be different contributions of those uh, causal pathways, perhaps to different groups, perhaps to uh, rural poor versus urban poor. But here's one possibility about how it might work. We find slightly higher incidences of developmental disorders like dyslexia and attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder in children from poorer backgrounds. Maybe those are more to do with the prenatal effects. Where children have more behavioral problems and they can't uh, regulate their emotions, uh, maybe that's coming more from the early parenting and the early uh, nurturing. And maybe when we see differences in language development, maybe that's differences in, in stimulation in the environment. Uh, and then maybe children's just natural experience in, in the physical world is enough to allow their spatial skills to develop sort of independently from their socioeconomic status. So in this study of, of, uh, of uh, socioeconomic status from a, a cognitive neuroscience perspective, it is important to distinguish between two different viewpoints. Y you can think of, of the effects of deprivation and poverty uh, as, a, as a sort of deficit. And, and maybe that would right, be right if you're thinking about uh, the, the effects of chronic stress or the effects of, of poor nutrition. But you can also think sometimes in terms of adaptation of uh, children behaving in the way they do given the environment they're in. So a child in a, in a more threatening environment, a more stressful environment, perhaps they need to be more vigilant. So they can't focus their attention, they can't afford to focus their attention, they need to be monitoring more widely. So maybe that's an adaptation rather than a deficit. And maybe the way children make decisions and regulate their behavior is because for them, they're in a, a scarce environment and there's no point in having long-term planning. They need to take what's in front of them. So we need to think carefully about what, what are deficits and what are adaptations. And the final thing to, to say about a cognitive neuroscience approach to the effects of, of poverty is just because we're finding effects in the brain doesn't somehow make them uh, immutable, like they're inevitable. There's uh, good evidence that, that interventions working with families uh, as well as with children to improve the way parents interact with children, to target more resources to those families, can have long-lasting beneficial effects on children's development.